What's all the fuss about, hey? <laughs> Welcome back to this week's edition of the Norwich City Pinkin.com podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Connor Southwell, joined by Paddy Davitt, Samuel Seaman, and Darren Eady and his inflatable canary to uh, pick through Norwich City. Well, that's that's anticlimactic. Just as we started, the canary has uh, has, has fallen, and hopefully that that's going to fall off him at some point. But anyway, we plow on a chaotic start to the the show, which was unlike Norwich City's performance today at Carrow Road. They've uh, beaten Birmingham City by two goals to nil in the Championship, a much needed result at least after what unfolded last week at Home Park. Um, Paddy, and, and that's probably the best way to start, really. The headline will be the the result, 2-0. Um, comfortable, assured, a clean sheet. Lots of, uh, of of positives after what happened last week. Give us your thoughts on what was a, a good day for Norwich City. Yeah, yeah, it went the right way, didn't it, in the end? Although, half-time today, you know, I wrote about it in my pointers, there was a bit of a, I felt, a mood in the stadium that was a little bit of a still holding pattern they wasn't quite sure which way it was going to go um, in terms of the mood and the reaction because um, positive element I thought David Wagner was spot on really post-match in how he broke the game down you know he talked about first half they had the control didn't really create the, the level of chances the final pass the final decision wasn't quite right um, but then second half they stepped it up and they scored two goals in, in early in terms of just before the hour mark and, and then it completely transformed it you know from that point onwards Birmingham looked limited and yes they had one or two opportunities which we'll probably dig into in more depth but overall it was a fairly comfortable game management exercise which again he alluded to in contrast to Stoke recently at Car Road where he felt they, they let the game fray a little bit and they were hanging on a bit there was none of that today I felt and um, and importantly you know the reaction then I mean we were back to mutual hand claps and applause and coordinated um, displays of affection between fans and players and coaches at the final whistle. And uh, it was notable that Wagner was the last person off the pitch, really. And then it just popped into my head, you know, contrast that at five o'clock on Saturday to last Saturday at five o'clock, the, the, the total difference in mood around Norwich's season and those individuals. And uh, and so that was, that was the key takeaway today. Yes, you could uh, debate about how limited Birmingham were in many aspects of their craft, and you know Norwich. It was no, by no manner of means, a polished, complete performance. But given the backdrop, which was you know an horrendous day down at Home Park, then to back up what they did, albeit in a losing effort against Fulham with a much changed side in the League Cup, and then more importantly today, back on Championship duty, points at stake, reputations at stake. Given it was the ten of the same eleven who started against Plymouth. I think overall, yeah, job done. And uh, as David also said in his post-match, we don't need to, almost as if you can't even mention the P word now, we don't need to speak about that game. That was a one-off and they've consigned it to the category of blip rather than part of a wider malaise. So they're the, they're the key takeaways for me today that um, when they had to respond, they did it. And, um, and now hopefully they can move on again and uh, we're not ever back again in terms of the turmoil and the tumult that was thrown up by getting whacked 6-2 by a newly promoted club. Yep, and uh, given what happened, <laughs> we will stop talking about Plymouth at one point, but give, given, given what happened last week in Devon, um, Sam, and, and it's interesting because often you go into games and it's performances that, that people look for. It kind of felt like it was going to be a result today, wasn't it, come what may, because of what happened last week, the need to get points on the board, the, the need to produce a response. So I, I guess if we're using that measure, this was a very successful day for Norwich City, wasn't it? Yeah, I think, to be honest, as much as um, it would be lovely to break down a sensational win with plenty of twists and turns and complex um, narratives, it was just your average championship win, really. And I think that will be exactly what David Wagner will have wanted going into the game after the chaos um, that was that, that Plymouth game. And of course, the concern that arose from it, I think to just come and produce a pretty consistent, pretty controlled performance where they probably weren't especially worried about losing the game at any point in it. And it felt like quite a comfortable ride for those home fans. Um, I think that's exactly what they needed just to get things back on a sort of an even keel and to get a little bit of decorum back in Carrow Road, of course. The last week has been all about where things went wrong and trying to dissect that and a lot of worry after what was quite a positive start to the season. So I think now 
they've got a good number of championship games under their belt. They've had some ups and downs. They've come through momentum. They've lost it. They've gained it again. It feels like, and it's something I keep speaking about, but it feels like when things are positive, it feels like they are really positive and they are signs of what's good about this Norwich team rather than just momentum, rather than just streaky runs, as we've spoken about um, during David Wagner's career as a, a characteristic of his teams. It now feels like these are just the signs of what his Norwich team are. And we've seen the players not in a constant state of doom and gloom and not in a constant state of, of constant momentum that we saw early on in the season. So I think this game, again, underlined what's been positive about them. And I'm sure we'll go on to discuss the home record because I think when they started to establish their, their run of good results at Carrow Road, I spoke about the fact that they needed something to feel like it was a safe haven when things were going wrong. And that's exactly what it's been this week. You know, you look at a tough, a tough week, two games in, in four days, and then they're looking at where they're going. And I think the fact that they were at Carrow Road will have been a, a comforting factor for Norwich. And it will have given them a reason to believe after the positive run of results they've had there this season. So that feels like it's increasingly becoming a factor and increasingly becoming a positive for Norwich this season. So that's one of the main positives I'll take out of that today as well. A lot of performances and individual things that I'm sure will come on to that were positives as well. But just overall, to have such a calm, normal win, I think was exactly what Norwich needed at this point. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't that hot on the performance, to be honest, um, which maybe we'll, we'll get into a little bit. Certainly not as much as you guys, but I, I'm, I'm happy to you know say that it was a very good win and a comfortable win and they deserve to win and, and all of that good stuff, which is good. Um, you, you, you referenced Paddy. David Wagner made uh, one change from, from the starting eleven at Plymouth, which was um, quite interesting. There's, there's always two ways, isn't there, a, a head coach can go after a defeat like that. You either rip the whole thing up and start again, which, let's be honest, he probably doesn't have the options to do anyway, or you kind of restore faith in those who are involved with it. The, the fact he named the same back five, obviously with, with Angus Gunn, the two midfielders, it felt almost like a message, didn't it, I guess, to, to those playing. And, and, and I guess he will have been pleased with, with what he saw from, from those who were on the pitch in, in that regard today. Well, funny enough, Con, I mean, the way you framed it, I'd put that directly to him. That Take us into your mind now, the game's done and dusted. Well, why did you essentially retain faith with 10 of the 11 who performed so abysmally collectively and individually at Plymouth and um, and it wasn't as, as he responded about show your good players show that was a one-off basically you know put the onus on them to repair what they damaged effectively on the pitch at least and uh, he said it came down to freshness really that you know the majority of those didn't feature at Fulham certainly didn't start the game because he made nine changes um, and he just felt there was a, a freshness in that lineup. but he did also add the caveat you know they didn't really need to prove anything that that was a blip. They just needed to basically reconnect with the first six or seven games when they went unbeaten in League and Cup. And um, structurally, they, you know, they looked light years from what we saw under him towards the end of last season. And it was a kind of a, I think for him, he probably in his own mind clearly felt that this group of players were not what they showed at Plymouth. That isn't representative of this group this season. Um and for whatever reason, and I'm sure that he's, you know, he's dissected it at length behind closed doors, the manner they unravelled. And today, um, pretty much the players who'd got them into that very positive start to the season did deliver um, and maybe did show that that was a one-off, certainly on the scale of the defeat and the, the performance, which was unacceptable. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that in his own words, was what, what drove his selection policy today, that... You know, particularly if you focus in on the, the back five, it's not as if you had a huge amount of opportunities. To, I mean, Danny Bart comes into the equation, doesn't he? Jaden Warner, probably a, a bridge too far, despite a very positive first outing in, in senior colours at Fulham. So, you know, is Jack Stacey going to be replaced by Kellen Fisher? No. Is Sam McCallum going to replace Dimi Yanoulis? No. Is George Long going to replace Angus Gunn? So it's... Because it was noticeable when the team news dropped an hour before, there was clearly a discourse on social media amongst some Norwich fans... Um, why hasn't he gone wholesale? What, what message does this send that he's rewarding the failure of those who were on duty against Plymouth? But if you take a step back, what options has he got to, to sort of go down that path, particularly in terms of defensively? I mean, it's a very slim unit in terms of senior players he's working with defensively. So, you know, I think we discussed it. I think Forshaw's coming in, Sarah further forward was the type of changes I thought we'd see. So it was a surprise 
it was just Puerta in and Huang out um, overall. But if you're asking me, was I surprised that he didn't rip up his back four and keeper? No, because I don't think he's got the, the ability to do that at the minute. Um, allied to the fact that, yeah, it was the same back four and keeper who, who got them into a very positive start. And while well, they did ride their luck at times uh, today, um, you know, that clean sheet hopefully will, will just underline again that they... Yes, there's there's clearly vulnerabilities in that group of defenders. I think I think we we can all see that. Um, I mean, it was graphically illustrated at Plymouth, um, a susceptibility to you know to pace and an intent and 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 youth almost as well in terms of Plymouth's front forward players. But you know it wasn't just the back four or it wasn't even the centre backs who who unravelled at Plymouth. It was the team collectively. You know there was no protection from that midfield that day and both against Fulham different players obviously and today the structure was a lot better they were a lot more solid um, and I think within a solid structure out of possession compact with, without the ball um, I think that is the best back four he's got to play with so you know not a surprise that he didn't tinker with the defence maybe a slight surprise that he didn't change it up in terms of central midfield and further forward but you know ultimately he's, 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 he's measured by results and getting the win and he did that so you know he will say he was justified in the way he went today and nobody could dispute that you know they, they've walked off the pitch with three points and a clean sheet so um you know while you know people can with hindsight look back and say he got things wrong at Plymouth or, or maybe once the team lose dropped today had he got things wrong clearly that wasn't the case so um but I, I still on a purely in terms of the defensive aspect of this debate I don't think that does now mean definitively that this group of defenders aren't going to be susceptible again. I think <laughs> there's clearly issues there and they've been exposed most graphically against Plymouth, but right back to the opening day against Hull, you know, that there is a vulnerability in certain situations against certain opponents. And for me, that is a concern moving forward because I think better teams than Birmingham would punish Norwich. So, you know, but that's for David and his coaching staff to try and... Uh, you know, counteract that that if this is the group of defenders they want to work with, that they they can be more often not robust and resolute and uh, within the right structure. Um, you know, in, and and it's worth pointing out in his view, the best keeper in the division who underlined that again probably today at nil nil early in the second half with a great stop. Um, that you know there is a base to build from and go on and have the type of season that the first six or seven games suggested was possible. Yeah, I, I, it's it's. Yeah, I agree, and I felt it was if if you were to pick a game for Norwich City after what happened last week, I think you'd have probably picked that one because Birmingham were were pretty poor. I mean, John Eustace was was asked post match about kind of the opportunities that they squandered and particularly relieving the pressure on on Jay Stansfield, who who looks basically a cut above um, their other attacking options to be to be kind, but they made pretty poor. Um, choices in possession or they did, they did create opportunities maybe the the better ones um coming after Norwich City's two goals but there was one noticeably Sam before that which was um it, it was from Stansfield got played through lovely pass uh, in behind Jack Stacey he's, he's at an angle actually I've, I've watched it back I think uh, if he go if he curls the ball uh kind of unaided I, I think it, it's probably a goal but Shane Duffy does excellently well to just get something on the ball take it basically towards Angus Gunn and allows him to, to make a save. So it's a, a testament, again, for for the defence, isn't it? And, and the work that, that they've done, both both Gunn in particular, who, who also got criticism last week after, after Plymouth. And um, I saw that and I'm sure you guys have as well. But Shane Duffy as well, two two players who had major criticism atoning for it there. It felt like a really significant moment because that was probably Birmingham's best, uh, best spell of this game within that five-minute period before the goals. Well, it's one of those where... Yes, Birmingham were the worst side in the game, but it wasn't close enough to be able to say that had one or two moments not gone slightly differently, Norwich wouldn't have been in big trouble. And as you say, that was such a huge moment in the game because it was a very good chance. And Jay Stansfield, is it Jay? Yeah, there you go. He will be uh, he will be very disappointed that he missed that chance. It was a good chance. Um, and he has the chance to put Birmingham 1-0 up midway through the second half against the Norwich team with a crowd that have been with them throughout this season but probably after the events of the last week would have been willing to turn and it would have got quite toxic I think quite quickly had Norwich gone 1-0 behind so that did feel like quite a major moment not only in the game but also in the mid-term for Norwich but yeah as you say it was 
probably a very pleasing moment for Shane Duffy and Angus Gunn. I think Angus Gunn, probably more than anybody else in that Norwich team, has done enough to have one bad performance and keep his place in the team. But there's no doubt in the fact that he could have improved um, his performance against Plymouth. He was at fault for, not not in a major way for any of them, but I think he could have done better with multiple goals in Devon. And he'll be delighted after a strong performance from George Long at Fulham to have put those fears temporarily um, to rest. And Shane Duffy, I felt for him a little bit after the Plymouth debacle because similarly to Gunn, actually, he's been very, very good. And it was a one-off poor performance. I think especially at Carrow Road this season, he's been absolutely solid for Norwich. Um, He's actually a very intelligent defender. You can see the experience in his play almost because... He sits off and sits off and sits off quite often and you have a little bit of fear and then just at the right time he makes that tackle and that was the situation um, with Stansfield today really. So I think he underlined why Wagner had the faith in him to keep him in the team after that horror show um, and he probably under underlined why he's been such a key player for Norwich so far this season. I, I don't know how... Actually looking at that performance, he managed to dip so far below his own level um, in that last game, to be honest, it doesn't really make sense in the context of his last five or six performances outside of that result. But he he stepped up. I think Ben Gibson alongside him stepped up in a big way. I thought he was actually quietly very, very good today, to be fair. So, um, yeah, I think they will be pleased with their performance. And as you said, that was the moment really that underlined the strength of Norwich's defensive work in a game where it was probably under the microscope more than it has been at any point in in the recent past because he conceded six goals and everyone looks at the centre backs. For me, that was the main area that I was. I mean, I agree that structurally you can't change much, and there wasn't there weren't many more than one changes Wagner could have made to that back four. But I was absolutely shocked that he kept the same centre back pairing and kept Danny Bart on the bench. And I think most people associated with the football club will have been when they saw that so um, for that defensive unit with Gunn and Duffy to to play so well under such pressure will have been a, a huge relief for them and I'm sure earns them a bit of credit back after um, probably the first dip in Duffy's career sort of with Norwich fans because I think they've loved him up to this point there was quite a lot of doubt but hopefully now he's getting back to the the sort of levels of trust that we saw early on because I think he has earned it overall. Yeah, I thought Ben Gibson was good today as well, actually quietly uh, again. And I think actually he's had pretty productive season so far. Maybe not outstanding, but but certainly um, some, some decent performances in there. And and, and, and that moment, Paddy uh, followed what was a, a real surge for Norwich City for five minutes where we just saw in a game that up to that point probably lacked a little bit of quality on, on both sides, was a little bit stodgy, was threatening maybe to... To, to go against them. They just seemed to be able to to find a, a higher gear to slip it into for five minutes. Scored two excellent goals, obviously starting with that one from from Gabriel Sara and then and then Huang with an excellent flick in the in the build up for a second to, to tee up John Rowe. It, it it is that I guess that ability which um made this team win games so frequently at the start of the season. The 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 ability to just find a higher gear at points. And in a game like this where we've discussed Bum, Birmingham and their shortcomings, it was probably necessary to, to win the game and I'm sure that's what David Wagner would have been telling them at, at half time. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it is two moments of individual quality, and they do have that in offensive areas, and um, you know, which is why it is so important if they can get that structural element right, which is on Wagner and his coaching staff, particularly without the ball. Um, there's no doubt they can hurt teams at this level. I mean, the two players who've scored the goals, John Rowe. That was the John Rowe uh, from earlier in the season in terms of he picks that ball up from Huang and nothing other in, in his head than drive, commit defenders, confidence to shift it, you know, with a Ronaldo-esque step over. And then on his left, a uh, wonderful finish, low into the bottom corner past John Ruddy, just instinctive. And, and he's got that quality and we've seen it now. And there's been a little bit of a lull and I think maybe that's... It's worth remembering this is his first in terms of consistently starting games. This is the first stage in his senior career that he's had that. There was going to be a dip, inevitably. That the heights that he was scaling, the respect he's now getting from opponents, you can see that. You know, Millwall was the first example of that where they've gone within five minutes of kickoff, they've gone through the back of him because he is now, when these teams are doing analysis tactically on Norwich, 
they have to stop John Rowe. And that's a huge testament to him that he, he's already assumed that position within this Norwich collective uh, in terms of the attacking Arsenal. Um, and what can you say about the Brazilian? I thought he was absolutely majestic today. Best player on the pitch by a mile. What he, what he can do with a football. Um, Pass for the outside of the boot to yeah, Rowe in the to first half. In the first half, yeah. Just... Um, but his intelligence in terms of spaces and again, tying the two together, the individual quality, but also the structure that Wagner wants. Him and McLean, it's essential that they have an awareness, spatial awareness, that they can make the angles to take the ball off Duffy and Gibson to move City through in terms of vertical possession. And uh, and today he was really good at that. And and then obviously the goal, you know, and as Wagner said after the game, you know, it, atypical in terms of an, you don't associate maybe necessarily with Brazilians that he, he relishes the physical element of it and the, and, and the sort of the the athletic ability that he's got as well it, it doesn't phase him you know that's why I think we're now starting to see him blossom in English football this season particularly that you know he can mix it up now clearly there's elements in his game and it was alarmingly evident again at Plymouth defensively he doesn't have those natural instincts in terms of a screening midfielder and that's the type of area of the pitch he's playing in and with Wagner not having your out and out holding Ollie Skip star midfielder you know, there is an onus on him and McLean to do that defensive side and, and there was a total abdication from them two really in the first half at Plymouth so you know he's not the complete midfielder but but my word on the ball he is peerless in this Norwich team in terms of his ability and uh, but we all know that anyway you know that's why he's being linked in recent windows with you know higher level clubs and that will continue if what I hope now is that you know today he basically ran that game he he was the key influence in why Norwich have got that result over the line really now if he can maintain that and and step forward and say, right, I'm going to be the man now. I am going to lead this team without obviously having the captain's arm man on. But just in terms of his ability, then really Norwich do harbour genuine promotion ambitions. But but he is that intrinsically pivotal to the group. And and if he if his performance levels dip as they they have done on occasion this season, then you know it goes the other way in terms of where maybe where Norwich can pen, pitch, pitch their tent in terms of what is possible what is feasible this season he is, he is absolutely crucial to the outcome of this season and um, you know today a headed goal you know we've seen what he can do with his feet and, and if he can continue to tick up on the assists and goals count then you know it also offsets in the interim anyway no Barnes no Sergeant because um, you know it, it increasingly feels doesn't it that, and we've said this on previous pods since those two have been unfortunately ruled out for a period of time that they're in a little bit of a holding pattern now. If they can get themselves in and around the top six by the turn of the year, when those two players should be back and available, then I think they can have a really good crack at it. But to do that, players like Sarah are going to have to take a step forward. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and just on Gabby, Sarah, Sam, I mean, when there have been points this season. I thought it certainly when uh, Norwich played Southampton, basically those early, early games where he was the best player on the pitch, not just from a Norwich City perspective, but in terms of um, in, in terms of the opposition as well. I think you can basically take Dewsbury Hall and Leicester out of it because of the level that they're operating. But now Gustavo Hamer, who was at Coventry, who I think was was regarded last season as probably the best all-round midfielder in the division. Obviously, he's now gone to Sheffield United. Is there a conversation that Gabby Sarah is is up there at, at this level in terms of the best central midfielder in in, in the division? I think he's got to be when you look at the level of competition there is in the championship I don't think there's many that really stand out you highlighted some of those players who who stood out last year and obviously most of those have have migrated from the the division um now so it's quite difficult to really look at too many teams and say that they've got a player as talented as Norwich obviously you, you underlined Leicester and they've probably got you know, maybe eight or nine who are in that sort of top level championship bracket and, and on the same level as Sarah but outside that maybe Southampton have a couple who get close but he's he's the overall package really and you don't tend to get that at this level I think the only reason why Norwich have maybe managed to retain him and might manage to retain him through January is a lack of consistency I still think he can be churning these performances in a little bit more often we saw Emi Buendia in that season where he was by far and away the championship's best player won that player of the year award basically carried on I know Norwich were a good team but he 
they wouldn't have been near it without him. And they he, a great team. Yeah, and he carried them to it. Um, and we saw from him week in, week out, every week he could be relied on, relied upon to create chances, to create moments. I think it was 32 goal contributions in the end. And it was very, very rare that he would have a game where Norwich fans couldn't rely upon him to produce something. And I think we've just seen probably four or five from Gabriel Sarra where he's gone off the boil. So as much as I would praise his performance today, I think even within within his performance against Birmingham, there were probably ways he could improve. I thought his work on the ball in the first sort of half an hour could have been improved. I think he checks back a little bit too often, especially with somebody who has the attributes to drive through the middle. I think he he declines that opportunity sometimes a little bit too often. But I think in the second half, we really saw him take off and we saw the player that, that won the August Player of the Month, really. What I would just like to see from him is, is being able to reach those levels on a consistent basis. I think that's a reasonable hope that he'll he'll find after a year in in football. And I think coming straight from Brazil... His first year in English football, I think you can understand some inconsistency, especially in a team that's as poor as Norwich were under Dean Smith. But after a year, I was hoping the the main difference would be because you know he was even he was reaching his top or close to the level he's reached this season at times last season. Um, but I was hoping what we would see as the the main step up from last season would be added consistency and I, I think over the last month or so he's struggled to find that so it was good to, to see him back to back to his best today and it felt like when he scored that goal I think he knew in his head that he maybe hasn't been at his best in recent games and that celebration to me looked like one where he knew he had that tangible contribution and he knew he had that moment where people knew he was back and I think that's Obviously, fantastic news for Norwich. Um, I wrote a column actually about Boris Science and how the the role that he's been cast in has been almost saviour of Norwich City's season, especially before this game, after he scored that goal against Fulham. But what I actually felt was being underrated was the ability of players who have who have been key early on in the season to step up. And I think Jonathan Rowe is somebody who, you know, for understandable reasons, of course, I'm not necessarily criticising these players especially harshly but Jonathan Rowe, Christian Fasnax, Gabriel Sarah, Jack Stacey these are all players who have not had fantastic months and I think as much as we can look at Ashley Barnes and Josh Sargent's injuries and we can look at Borja Science and say that he could be the the answer to those problems those players stepping up can also help Norwich navigate this tough period and get out of those that run of poor results and I think Gabriel Sarah is the most important of those players so yeah, I'd agree with you. He's definitely up there with the Championship's best players, especially when you take Leicester out of the equation. Um, and with a player like that in their side, there's not really any excuse for Norwich not to be making a run for the playoffs. So hopefully he can improve that consistency. But we saw, I think, close to his top level in the second half today. And um, David Wagner, well, will have been and, and was very pleased with, with, his, with his performance. I think what it is with him, when, when Norwich keep getting him the ball, he, he's we see him at his best. What I don't think he does particularly well is is grab hold of a game and, and get Norwich to get kind of does that for Norwich, if that makes sense. I think he needs the the structure to be right. He needs to Norwich to keep finding him rather than than him kind of finding himself and, well, and grabbing sort of what the. What Wagner suggested post match and when he was asked about him by Paddy, that was basically he, he was what he said. He said. He, when the structure's right around him and he's in the right positions, that's when he's he can be most dangerous. Yeah, great minds. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, uh, John, John Rowe for the second goal. It, it was great finishing. I think you summed it up nicely. But I just thought we'd be a, worth a quick mention for for Huang in that before we uh, we we close part one of the pod because he's someone that I don't think we've seen much of in and I mean that in a positive sense so there was I know David Wagner said that he was pretty pleased with his work off the ball at Fulham um, but I don't think we've we've seen too much for, from an attacking perspective I thought he was a bit better in that regard today and actually there was a, a moment and I think you pointed out when he took the ball to the corner instead of, of, of taking a shot as he did against Stoke so maybe there's some signs that that, that education is is getting there but um, we probably show we probably were shown sorry that those aspects that David Wagner spoke about in terms of his athleticism and his energy to get ahead of Bielik to nick that ball to John Rowe in the first place. It was a, a really clever bit of play from the South Korean. 
Yeah, and, and even though he's an experienced player, it is going to take him time to be dropped into you know a very short notice. And of course, you know it was thick end of two weeks from when the deal went through that he was actually <coughs> linking up with that group of players um, because of his international commitments. But you know he will still need time to adapt. David's at every press conference he was asked again after the Fulham game about it and reiterated that you know he'll have to do a lot of video analysis work and it's not so much the uh, out of possession work it, it, you get clearly the sense that and David actually has touched on his fitness levels which if you've not kicked a ball really in anger for Forrest for the thick end of whatever I know he went off then back to South Korea and had a bit of a loan spell but you know it, it will take him a period of time the problem he's got and I'm sure that David when they brought him in, they thought, well, we need to do something with a Josh Sargent time scale. Of course, at that point, Ashley Barnes was fit and available. So he's had to he's had to um, fast track him to a degree because I'm sure if Ashley Barnes was fit and available, we wouldn't really probably be seeing too much of Wang at this stage. Um, but that is the way the cards have fallen. And um, yeah, today was the, the best I think we've seen him in terms of making an impact. Um, and you just hope now, you know, that with each new game he gets each training session he gets um that is you know the attributes that they've clearly identified in this guy because he was the one they wanted once they realized sergeant was out for the length of time he is going to be out that we start to see more and more of that and i think we will because you know as david reiterated again today it's very hectic at the moment you know it's swansea again now in a couple of days then it's coventry um OK, there's an international break, but then he'll go off and play for his country, I would imagine. And and, and then it's a very busy, busy period between then and, and Christmas time. So he will get his opportunities. Um, it would just be nice. There was one opportunity, I think he had to, and he skied it over, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Just thought today, what would have been perfect in terms of the overall is if he'd got himself on a score sheet. Because, you know, whether you're a young striker or you're an older striker, confidence breed is bred from scoring goals, isn't it? And um, he just needs a goal, I think, now. If he can get a goal, then you know you, we might start to see a little bit more of the player who, if you go back to his time in, in France with Bordeaux, who was uh, prolific in Ligue 1 relative to the amount of games he played. So, you know, there is a, clearly a quality player there. Forrest aren't spending the money they're spending, if that's not the case. He's played in World Cups for his country. Um, so we've probably been too quick to judge, to be honest, and that's a bit unfair to him, given that, you know, he's probably found himself fast-tracked um, and he hasn't really clearly adapted yet. So um, I thought Adam Eder was good again today, if I'm honest. You know, first half, he had their two best opportunities and um, and he looks to have responded to the extra responsibility now in the post-Sergeant sort of Sergeant Barnes period that we're in. Um, and he's got one or two goals and you can see that he's playing with a bit more confidence. So hopefully, you know, Huang can maybe get himself on the score sheet in these next few games. And, um, and then it's an interesting conundrum there because we saw John Rowe central today. David, after the game, actually talked about how he'd got Rowe and Fashnacht in his office in the build-up and wanted them both to almost share those duties of the second striker. Although, as it panned out, it was more Rowe than Fashnacht, I think we'd, we'd all agree. So, you know, such a fluid situation there now in either being probably the out-and-out and then it's who plays around him. So, you know, these players, Huang, John Rowe, Fashnacht, even Liam Gibbs, or if he gets an opportunity... Nunes when he's fit and available again there's a real battle warming up now it feels to to try and offset the fairly large loss that is no sergeant no Barnes part two of the pod and, and as we I mean no city today played their, their ninth game of the championship season it will be uh, 10 when they go to Swansea in midweek which is always the time that I was told that you need to start looking at league tables and, and taking things into or, or you could start looking at league tables and, and maybe um, beginning to form some sort of solid analysis of, of, of various things so I thought we'd, we'd have given we're not going to do a podcast now till post Coventry next Sunday I thought we'd do a general maybe zoomed out look as to how Norwich City's start to the campaign has gone so I'm, I'm going to ask both of you um but I'll, I'll start with you Paddy um Norwich are, are, are seventh it's it's been a, a, an interesting start quite quite large highs stupidly low lows as well one low, yeah. uh one low yeah um is th is this now a search for consistency over the over the next stage of the of the season are we still looking for answers as to what this Norwich City team is how good this Norwich City team are I'm just doing the maths now. It's 16 points, isn't it? Yep. 16 from nine. So, you know, it's the old um, two points per game ratio. They're tracking currently yeah. basically what you need to get in the playoffs. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, I was just yeah, just under the threshold of two a game, isn't it? So, yes, there's your answer. You know, you maintain this body of work over the entirety. Um, 
easier said than done, then you finish top six, and that for me re- represents. However, then it went on pl- played out in terms of the end game. That's a successful season um, from where they where they finished last season and what they did over the summer and the financial you know uh, restrictions they had to operate under. So, yeah, I, Plymouth aside because of the epicness of that defeat in terms of scale. Um, one bad half at Rotherham, you know, Leicester showed what they're all about, but Norwich did push them that night. I think it's been a very, very consistent start, if I'm honest. Um, coloured, of course, because of the proximity of the Plymouth game. It didn't feel like that, certainly in the in the immediate aftermath. But, you know, with that win today, as I say, with a zooming out, a touch, nine games in, 16 points, um, far more positives and negatives. And, and hopefully, as I say... <coughs> Science to drop in there, Sergeant and Barnes to come back in. Um, you know, a real sense that second half of the season they could have a real good go at it. Sam, how are you feeling about Norwich City? Yeah, okay. I think playoffs wouldn't be um, too far of a stretch at, at this stage, really. The only concern I would have is the fact that if you try and extrapolate these nine fixtures across the rest of the season, of course. About half of them include Josh Sargent and the other half don't. And Norwich are going to now go, what, th- yeah, now three months without Josh Sargent. So that would be my worry. It's about whether the positive factors that are going to be coming into play, like science, like Huang adapting to this team, like probably Adam Eder growing in confidence and getting a few more games under his belt. It's about how much those positives that are going to come into play can now offset the losses of Sargent and Barnes. But then if you look at what life was like when they were still um, available for selection, both of them, that was actually sort of league winning form. So even if they managed to sort of bungle through the next couple of months with maybe upper mid table form, you'd think when Sargent and Barnes are back in, back in, you know, contention that Norwich can go on and, and get the sort of form that's going to get them up into the playoffs. So I, do feel quite positive um it feels very much in the balance at this stage i think we're at early we're in other championship seasons with norwich it's been quite clear cut quite early on um you know looking back at sort of even neil adams tenure it felt like at this point in the season they were absolutely nailed on to go and win the championship it really really feels in the balance and i i honestly feel it could go Either way, so it's it's difficult to really commit. I'm aware I'm doing some quite significant fence sitting here, but it is more positive than I was probably expecting. I think whoever wants to go back and see what prediction I I gave at the start of the season will realise where they are now is is quite far ahead of where I felt they might be over the whole season. Um, but I am reticent to to say that they're looking entirely positive there are definitely a few negatives and some worrying factors that it isn't easy to just just swat away um this early in the season and I think problems that could could go on and develop but there are enough positives there that I think Norwich can can feel confident going into um the rest of the season and David Wagner can probably be happy with the job he's done in the first nine games the thing that stood out to me earlier as a a positive factor was the fact that They've they've got more points than Leeds and Southampton at this stage of the season, and they're you know I think I would say it's the top three um, favourites for promotion are quite clearly the the three relegated sides, and to be ahead of two of those at this stage of the season is a major positive for Norwich. I think we saw from when um, when they won the title in twenty twenty one that the teams that go on and be entirely successful sometimes do have trouble adapting to the championship when they drop down. So I would expect that Leeds and Southampton maybe find a slightly higher level, but just for, for right now being above those teams and being above a lot of the teams that are below them. I mean, you look at Stoke and how much they've struggled and Norwich were a team that a lot of people, well, nobody was really considering to be in the promotion race. And then you look at some of the teams who who were favorites going into it and Norwich have come out of it favourably. So if they can carry this on, of course, it's going to be a, a major positive, but plenty of, of roadblocks on the way and it's difficult to commit either way right now, really. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a, a fair assessment. I'm, I am I still feel... Yeah, like, yeah, I still f- would put myself in the don't know camp. Mm. Um, just because I, I would say... 
not been that impressed with the last five performances, I think, from, from basically Rotherham onwards. Um, yeah. And I think I'd put today in a relatively, maybe similar one to what we saw against Stoke, which was a game, obviously, that they that they won um, and, and they won today. So that's that's ultimately the most important thing. And it's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds in, in the next few weeks. They've got quite a tricky run coming up, I, I think, post uh, obviously two tough away games this week I'm not discarding those but definitely um, post-international break um, between the October and November one I think they've got what is quite a tricky fixture list so it's going to be interesting to see how they how they contend with uh, how they contend with those um, let's look ahead to this week um, before we look at the footballing aspect Pad we should look at the off-pitch aspect uh, on Monday the, we are going to find out whether or not these um, these uh, shares are going to be um, allocated to Mark Asanasio. Our expectation is they will. Uh, and I think that the signs at the moment are looking pretty positive. Um, and, you know, we, we, we did a podcast on this explaining exactly what that means. So, so, so for people who aren't aware, I would, I would go and watch that. But to give you a streamlined version, essentially, it means that he will he will take 40% of the club, as will Delia and Michael um, as well. So they, they will be there will, will be parity in, in, in that regard. Feels quite a, a, a seismic moment, as we've discussed, I think, since his involvement came along, Pad, it would um, it would certainly mark the sh- the end of something and possibly the the start of uh, of something new as as well and and I guess it it probably gives reasons for supporters to feel excited hopeful beyond maybe what they're seeing on the pitch at the moment yeah well i mean it it is a seismic change it's the end it would be subject to ratification on monday the end of majority ownership going back to <coughs> what did they celebrate recently was it 25 year milestone yeah it? so you know, generationally, that is a big moment in terms of the ownership slash custodianship because they're, they're very loath, Delia and Michael, to be seen as owners in that sense. They they see themselves as holding the baton for the, the supporters, basically, for the for the next iteration. And that increasingly would look like the Mark Atanasio group. It's worth stressing group rather than the man himself. I mean, if you look at the documentation of an at shareholders, it's mapped out there who Norfolk Holdings are, his... Yeah, yeah, tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about that, because this this is a yeah. point that's been lost a little bit. It's, it's all been kind of centred on Mark Atanasio, and he's yeah. he's the the figurehead, I guess. But yeah. tell us a little bit more about what makes up that that Norfolk Holdings company. Yeah, well, you're testing me now because I, I think there's t- two or three vehicles within that. Yeah, and one of them is is Richard Resler, who was a long time. I think they were at university he, together, he weren't they? One of the ones that were at Carrow. Yeah, yeah, and a long time friend. Fam, uh, I think their families are very close by all accounts, and. Um, and obviously, I think he's in the same sort of financial services sort of background as well. And he's in he's in de facto charge of Orchard, I think, is one of the, the bodies. And then the other two, I think, is Mark Atanasio. So, but there's, which collectively, I think those three groupings are around about 80 odd percent, 83 percent of Norfolk Holdings, which is the company that, you know, essentially is the vehicle that, that the Atanasio group are using to, to you know, manoeuvre themselves into this position subject to shareholder ratification of course on Monday but that interestingly there's that leaves 17 percent or so which we don't know too much about beyond kind of it feels like they're, they're the sort of groups and individuals within that financial services sector so you know essentially it's obviously filtered through Mark Atanasio because he's the one who's came on the board you know he's the one who you know you know has driven this process in terms of right at the outset the private shareholder transfer with Michael Fulger and then subsequently smaller biops um, and now to this position which you know if it passes uh, in terms of those resolutions then yes we will move forward with another seat on the board for Mark Atanasio and his group in the shorter term, this lockstep agreement between him and his group and Delia and Michael in terms of they will vote with Michael and Delia for the next two and a half years or so as it is now. But really interestingly, if you go and actually forensically look at the documentation um, written into it in the shareholder agreement is essentially Atanasio and his group have first refusal now. If Delia and Michael at some point in the future decide that, okay, it's the right time is right for them now to divest themselves of their 40% shareholding written into that agreement is first refusal goes to Norfolk Holdings. So clearly there is now a roadmap to um, that very successful US sports tycoon, a uh, Milwaukee Brewers owner and the people around him, both family and and, and friends um, to assume control of Norwich city. And uh, you know, if you're a Norwich fan, 
and you don't want to get too hung up on the the uh, the, the financial parameters and what it all means and the you know the kind of legal ease that's around this process. Essentially, it means that a guy and a, uh, or a group uh, who have been you know very successful in terms of what they've done with a, a major league baseball club. I think they're, they're nailed on for the playoffs again this season by all accounts. Um, Do they get a trip to Wembley for that? Not that I'm aware of. Oh, right. No, no. Don't let's not go into a. What, Is that what, the one with the four corners? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's about <laughs> our limited knowledge of baseball. Um, as I said to Weber when he said he'd gone over there, was that rounders or whatever? Did he think he was watching rounders? <laughs> but uh, it's like rounders in PE. There you go. But um, so yeah, if I'm a, if I'm a Norwich fan and I'm I'm thinking what this all means, then. It is quite exciting, I would imagine, because it is something dramatically different from what has gone before for such a long period of time. Now we know that, you know, if we look at what's happened with the Brewers, we're not, we're not, we've not got a, an individual who's going to plough tens and tens of millions of pounds into it or dollars, because that's not how they've managed the Brewers. You know, it's still this hunt for marginal gains, effectively. But if you're coming from a, a baseline where you have uh, individuals who are worth considerably more than Delia and Michael, then clearly, and we can see that in terms of the debt refinancing package that have been woven into the, this current cycle uh, in terms of the shares, that they have the funds, both within their personal funds and also access to funds, that, that you know they can navigate Norwich onto a different path in terms of the financial power they've got, um, but woven very much around still as they've tried to do it under Delia and Michael, this self-sufficient, self-funded, trying to be clever, trying to be creative. You know, the emphasis on, <coughs> you know, in terms of the footballing aspect of it, you know, data and um, and those, as I say, marginal gains and trying to be one step ahead of the opposition, um, which in the better periods under Stuart Webber, they have been, clearly, uh, and, and borne the fruits of that success. So, in many ways, there's a continuity, maybe, in approach, but fundamentally, there's a huge difference in terms of the financial power between the existing ownership and the potential new ownership. And and that, if I'm an Norwich fan, um, trying to f- bridge uh, an ever-increasing divide, you know, between the Championship and the Premier League, that has to enhance their chances, I think, moving forward. Um, and it's quite clear, again, and this cycle underlines what's gone before, that the Atanasios are serious, they're in it for the long haul, and they really see in Norwich City something they want to be part of. And again, if I'm just a, a Norwich fan looking at it from afar... That's quite exciting. So, um, you know, all in all, subject to it all going through on Monday, I think it does mark a significant milestone in this process. Um, but it won't be the last one because, as I say, if you go back and look at the Sarah Older documentation, there is now a framework in place. When? Who knows? Um, but there is a framework in place for, essentially, down the line, a transfer of ownership. Indeed. And, and just to kind of go through... A- few of the boring details on, on Monday, uh, most shareholders have, have been and they've been encouraged to vote by proxy. So I don't think we're, we're actually expending, uh, expecting many, many sort of bums on seats at that particular meeting, which is just formulaic in terms of you vote, you go home. There's no kind of discussion or, or conversation with, with anybody there. They need a simple majority and there's a, a third party company who are um, counting and, and verifying the votes, obviously, for, for obvious reasons, given the people involved are kind of the key players at Norwich City. Uh, worth mentioning as well, only Zoe Webber from the current board of directors um, is entitled to vote because of various conflicts of, of interest and, and stuff like that. But um, we will, of course, keep you updated on our channels on Monday evening. I think it's six o'clock that meeting takes place. We'll find out pretty swiftly after that whether or not it has gone through. So worth um, keeping an eye on that. And as we have done with this story, we'll keep you updated as and when to uh, take the pod in a different direction we didn't get to do this last week because Norwich City decided that they were going to get absolutely pummeled by Plymouth so we had to be quite negative and quite moaning I'm afraid so we couldn't do any uh, light-hearted fun that we uh, that we like to do um, so Sam I'm going to say the word Stonehenge to you thoughts an amazingly spiritual place I think maybe one of my favorite landmarks in the country I for one appreciate all the uh, <laughs> I don't think this is what you were saying last week, by the way. <laughs> to be fair, I was less dismissive of it than you were. But, um, yeah, I think it's... I, I'm impressed by the fact that it was, like, moved before high-level <laughs> technology. Was it, I, was it, I don't know about the spiritual element of it. I'm not, I'm not sure that's... I'm not really the right sort of person to be speaking on that level. But you didn't seem to be impressed in, in any way, I think. Was it... 
bunch of rocks was that is that in the a field, correct yeah. term? Bunch of in a field, to be fair. Yeah, and and actually, I think you know someone did remind me that um, I was very dismissive of it, and then that that Norwich City performance happened. So I don't know if the spirits have gone against me there yeah. or whatever. And, and also to to follow up on that, so I've I've obviously I mean I don't get it to be honest. Like surely just a load of people have moved them. I don't really see what the but they're massive and they're like in the ground and they're on top of each other. Yeah, but if you've got loads of people, could you not just lift it? <laughs> yeah, but some of them are like nine foot in the air or something. How are you going to get it up there? Here's, here's, a, here's a different question for you on a similar thing. You know cranes, yeah, right? Oh, no. how, how, are they, how, how do you build a crane? You just keep going up a bit by bit, don't you? But how, how would you do that? <laughs> with a... <laughs> with, I don't know, with like... <laughs> With a big ladder, you just go up the ladder. But then what, you wouldn't need a crane. You could just use a ladder if ladders are that big. <laughs> because cranes, don't they pick things up? Is yeah, yeah but how do, you, how do you get them to that height? That's the point. That... <laughs> but with the ladder, you get up the ladder, you build the strong thing, and then the strong thing picks things up. You can't pick things up with a ladder. I can't believe we're doing this. You can't pick things up with a ladder. That's why you go up the no, ladder. No, no, you I'm make not, something yeah, yeah. strong at the top of the ladder. Well, I'm, and not, then I'm not talking about the crane thing. function. I'm talking about the, the, the structure of a crane. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, but that's why you have the big ladder. Well, I wondered if it's like something you build on the floor and then push up. That's another good shout. That makes more sense than yeah. doing it all on a big ladder. Yeah, but anyway, Stonehenge packed. Thoughts? <laughs> I don't really have any, you know. I think you you two have really took us down a strange old tangent. Um, I th I find it quite an impressive structure, and I'm not as dismissive as you are. But uh, you know, beyond that, it was uh, just an interesting landmark. I don't think we need to dive. We, we right, don't need right, to spend right. another second on. Here's a different question: Would you pay twenty five pounds to go and look at it? Any closer than what we did last well, last that, week? That's the point. I think we had a pretty good view of it from the A whatever it was three oh three. Although I didn't because I was driving, so I didn't look out. That's but, a scam, uh, isn't it? Come on. But I wouldn't pay when you can see it quite that's clearly from I mean. the road. Yeah, yeah. But if you, if you want to look at it closer, just buy some binoculars. Well, yeah, well, all I'll say is, you know, there was a lot of camper vans there, so you know, no, there's, no. there is a constituency who clearly do find some in a spiritual meaning to it so let's not be too dismissive and, and actually you know, I woke up the next morning and um, you know checked my phone and ended up down a TikTok rabbit hole and the first the first thing as I clicked on it that I saw right was a load of people I don't know if this is real <laughs> but loads of people dancing inside Stonehenge so like, I don't know maybe that's um, a bigger point about I don't know phones listening to you do you or know whatever, what, do you know what? It, let's do it let's get it on record now here. if Norwich get promoted you've got to go to Stonehenge <laughs> And pay twenty five pounds, and dance round the rocks. Okay, that, I'll, 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 the twenty five pound allows you to dance round the rocks. I thought the twenty five pound would only get you so close. Is there not, you, 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 you think there's like a rope round it? Don't I you? thought there's like a yeah, yeah like some be, sort of thing in the way. On the rocks and dance round. No, 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 I wouldn't do that. That's... In the proximity of said rocks, <laughs> bust some moves. That's done. That's decided anyway. Now, if Norwich get promoted, you're going to Stonehenge, and we'll film that, okay. and that'll be gold content. That okay. Can I also say I'm as dismissive as like the Angel in the North, which I think, oh, yeah. which I think is an eyesore, to be quite frank. I agree. I agree <laughs> um, on that. Yeah, so, yeah. so there we go. Uh, let's let's get back to uh, to this week, which is a big one for Norwich City. They travel to to Swansea in midweek. Hooray! Uh, and then uh, we get to go to uh, your old manor, Paddy, the Paddy Davitt Derby. Are you looking forward to that one next week? Um, well, I, mean, I get to see my family, so that's uh, extended family. So yeah. Um, like a bit of CBS in terms of a media setup, so it was an entertaining game last year. We settled for that again, weren't we? So um, yeah, no, I think it's. I mean, Norwich really take a good following there. It's just I, I like the atmospherics in that stadium. Might be biased, but uh, I think that could be. And they've had a good win today. They've won at QPR three one. So yeah, that could be a good game. That yeah. But uh, am I looking forward to it any more? No, no, I can't lose. What one team who I like are going to win? So professionally or personally, I'm on. Unless it's a I'm draw. on a winner. Unless well, it's a draw. well, you know, but then both teams then get you, something. Then you're so the winner. then I'm the winner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I can't lose basically next weekend. It's a rare, rare occurrence that next weekend. So yeah, but uh, we got to get past Swansea first. So you know, let's let's deal with Swansea first. Thoughts on Swansea, Sam? I'm very excited actually. Oh, I can't wait for the. How long is it? Five and a half. To be fair, Plymouth has helped put it in context. Like last season. Swansea was the big old nightmare worst one. 
Whereas now it's only the second worst by about three hours. So do you, do you know, I think I think Chris Gorham put it in uh, context quite well because he's he said usually when you when you, so when you go to like Swansea or something you get two hours down the road and you're you're at Birmingham and it's like ah oh, it's not far from Birmingham really. Yeah. Um, you you get two hours down the road from Plymouth and you're at Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> so well yeah this is a nightmare and the the one the the worst bit I would say about the journey is getting to Cardiff which is a big oh, we're in Wales, must be near Swansea thing, and then it's like another hour. Um, so that's that's not something I'm looking forward to especially. But, uh, yeah, especially not on a Wednesday night. So cheers to whoever decided that would be a good idea. As, as, as an Ipswich fan on the fixtures, by the way, because wow, it's like it's yeah. Swansea midweek, Middlesbrough's midweek. It's ridiculous, really. But there we go. Yeah. I think we've got Bristol City on a Sunday coming up as well, but I don't think that's anyone's fault. I think that's... Is it rugby or something? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so there we go. Uh, let's let's finish then by by uh, looking at these two games. Um, we'll boil it down as we usually do to uh, the simplest bit of um, prediction stuff that you can do. Paddy, six points on offer for Norwich City. How many do they get from those two trips? Well, it'll be easy. I think Swansea had a good win today as well, haven't they? As well, uh, but one at Millwall, didn't they? Which is no easy task. So three nil, did they? it was three nil when I checked. Yeah, I don't know if it finished three nil. I, I, oh. I said well. Oh, yeah, one. they were definitely three 0 up going into the closing stages. Um, I could see two draws. I could see two draws, but I'm going to tip on to the positive side and say four, four points from six. I'm with you, Sam. I was thinking four. I think, yeah, great win for Swansea. Um, but they have been right in and around the bottom of the league. They haven't got too many players that I'd be especially worried about from a Norwich point of view. Uh, Coventry Brilliant. famous last words oh, well, <laughs> yeah. clip that up and put it on Norwich City unfortunate pictures or whatever it is count, yeah. Um, yeah so I think I do think they'll win at Swansea and then Coventry have a, a pretty decent team together I think they've been doing a good job maybe not quite as well as they as they were last season but I still think a point away at Coventry is a, a pretty good result so I would I would take four from a Norwich City perspective and I think they'll get four. There we go. That probably seems like an apt place. Uh, we can play this next week when Norwich City get one point or something. <laughs> and that, that, would be, that would be good. But that seems like an apt place to, to end the podcast uh, after what was a pretty calamitous week at um, uh, Plymouth last weekend. This was the perfect response. A week to go until the October international break and we can take stock fully. But that was a step in the right direction. Thank you very much for watching.